afternoon. Um, I'm going to share from the perspective of some case studies uh, some of the theories for underlying mechanisms, many of which you've heard during the course of this conference, and perhaps, I hope, something you'll take home that's a bit new as well. So, um, we just celebrated the birthday of Frederick Delius. He said, music is an outburst of the soul. And my friend Nietzsche, the great philosopher, said, um, without music, life would be an error. And uh, Charles Munch, the uh, well-known conductor, said, um, music is an art that expresses the inexpressible. So I will share with you, now that I'm accepting my age, I hope, that uh, over the f last four decades I've been a music therapist, I've been uh, a researcher, I've been a musician, I've, I've been a mom and now a grandmom and, you know, all those good things, but I have really used my career to figure out how can we document all those things those men have said about music. <laughs> I'm with you, Dr. Tremo, about the ancient wisdom and now how we can begin to explain what that's all about. But I've always been challenged uh, to document in scientific evidence the observations that we made. So you can imagine my enthusiasm when I was coming home on the subway and um, uh, there aren't too many uh, free magazines at the subway stops here in New York, but in Boston uh, you can pick up any number of free journals. And this one was Skirt Magazine, and I'm just, you know, rushing to the T, as we call it, the subway. And lo and behold, this is on the front page. Last night a CD saved my life, so I had to pick it up. Finally, I'm going to find out the truth. <laughs> Finally, I will learn how is it that a CD can save your life. And I just love the article written by Kelly Love Johnson. And Kelly um, was experiencing some psychic pain, you might say. She had a breakup with her boyfriend of many years. And last night, a CD saved her life. She came up with the saddest songs in the world slash wallow mix. <laughs> yeah, you know, I know them. We all have those, right? And she played that music, and she cried her eyes out, and she felt great. <laughs> so what is it about it? Dr. Tremo just left. I was going to ask him. What is it about this music that matches her mood. Long ago, I learned about the ISO principle. Oh, I was looking for you, Dr. Tremo, to explain how a CD can save one's life. <laughs> but seriously, um, there, there were a couple of um, theories that have been discussed. Dr. Tremo mentioned uh, the um, controversial mirror neuron theory. And I would pose this uh, for your consideration. Um, she plays uh, Otis Redding's I've Been Loving You Too Long, and boy does that speak to her. You know, she just resonates with that. And Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here. So I'm wondering, with this mirror neuron theory, if Pink Floyd really can be right there with her, that whether it's in her mind's eye or listening to that music, picturing, wish you were here, um, if she is finding the empathy that she needs in this music, in a kind of unusual way. So, um, so you know, these, these mirror neurons um, are reflective, literally, uh, of one's activity. And um, it seems like there's some real potential here to talk not only about, about empathy, but about the massive ways in which a CD can save your life, uh, in this case, in truth, uh, the way the music can relate to where you are so strongly 
that it induces the, the tears that need to release the stress hormones, and this, this connection is made. Many ways in which connection can be made with mirror neurons. <laughs> I couldn't resist showing you that. So, what happens when we're in pain? We've spent a day and a half now, I think, um, very articulately sharing what is known um, about this, this field. And for all of the uh, ancient philosophers who speak of pain, you would think we have gone a little bit further than we have. But um, indeed, there, there are many uh, researchers who, because of the new technologies, are able to help us find some vocabulary for describing what is happening, particularly as the musical stimuli uh, are introduced into a person's environment. So, um, Melzack and Wall, as, as you well know, proposed this gate theory of pain. Uh, Dr. Berger spoke about that just this morning, uh, how the pathways that are ascending meet the pathways that are descending, and um, pain is, is mediated in that way. But more recently, Melzack came up with this neuromatrix model, that there is a complex of neuropathways that interact in many different ways, uh, that concurrently there are neurotransmitters um, that inhibit pain signals. Uh, Dr. Tremo, other speakers have spoken um, of this more eloquently than I. But I want to um, mention in particular how these various elements of the multi-neuromatrix theory uh, come into play with music. So, you see on, on the bottom branches uh, of this tree, the sensory discriminative domain of pain. These are factors that affect our perception of pain, according to Melzack. The sensory discriminative is activated when the music therapists that I have witnessed here at Beth Israel are singing along with a patient. You've seen Joanne. One of our wonderful graduates, Mickey Kim, is here. When they work directly with a patient, they are flooding the sensory discriminative domains that affect pain. Um, you've heard about um, Benedicta Scheibe's work, uh, more dealing with the unconscious elements um, of music and Annie Heiderscheid and GIM. When we when we, when the music takes a person to a magnificent place in their mind's eye, the effective motivational domain is deeply affected and will consequently affect the perception of pain. And uh, you've heard Dr. Dilio speak uh, and Dr. Bratt at this conference. Um, I'm referring to their work in entrainment that is relevant to the evaluative and cognitive domain. When they say, take an instrument and represent your pain with this musical instrument. And then play that instrument, play out what that pain sounds like, feels like, how it's represented to you. And then let's change that ever so subtly ever so slowly, and let's change the nature of the pain. That is a direct reference to how one evaluates what's coming in, whether it's the pain stimuli or the musical stimuli that I myself am creating in this process. So I think uh, we've heard at this conference some remarkable examples of how, in this model, pain is perceived and changed in its perception. So I'd like to share with you uh, a case of a woman I worked with. Um, B.W. had um, cancer, uh, and um, she was quite a remarkable woman. Um, but she had uh, an extreme aversion to the needle sticks that were constantly a part of her treatment. And so she would have a panic attack in the garage of Dana-Farber. 
um, just awaiting the next blood draw. And uh, so obviously the anticipatory anxiety was contributing to the pain she felt with a simple needle stick. Um, but this re the repeated assaults um, was really causing trauma for her. And obviously she, she avoided um, being in this, in this place. So in sessions with, uh, with BW, I wanted to introduce her to as many musical tools as I could. And in our first session, uh, which by the way was concurrent with chemotherapy, and she ended up being a subject in um, a randomized controlled trial that, uh, that I did at, at Dana-Farber, and that's been published and I can lead you to that. But I'm here today to talk more about some of the cases, the responders, and even the non-responders uh, to treatment that challenge my thinking about how these mechanisms work and don't work. So with BW, um, the first session, uh, I said, you don't need to do a thing. I made no demands of her. I brought in some portable instruments. Um, I have a, a, a lyre, a small harp that I enjoy using. I have my Native American flute. I have um, a, a keyboard. I have a guitar, depending on how much energy I feel. I lug in my <laughs> instruments. And uh, I say, so I say to uh, VW in this, in this case, you know, do you have a preference? I've got all these instruments. I'm just going to play and uh, let the music do what it does for you. And so, um, so she, she really seemed to go to a different place when I played. I think in particular she liked the lyre. And I would just do glissandi on this small harp, you know, and, and it was quite, uh, quite nice for her. And then in the second session I invited her to play with me. Uh, to improvise with me. And I gave her a rain stick, something she could very simply do. I mean, how easy is that? To just balance that rain stick and hear these lovely sounds. She closed her eyes. She loved the effect of water uh, and water flowing in the rain. And so this was just heavenly for her. And then finally, uh, I said today in the third session, we're going to write a song. And she said, oh, I can't write a song. And I said, well, that's okay, because I can. Uh, and uh, I really would, would love to give you this opportunity to, uh, to perhaps say something to a loved one that you haven't had an opportunity to say. I said, can you think of something that you might want to say to someone? And she said, no. Mm -hmm. All right, well, okay. Um, but maybe, maybe there's a, a song that you really like, and we could put some new words to it and kind of personalize it for you, and maybe we'll just have some fun with it. Uh, is there a, a song that you really like? And she said, no. <laughs> and uh, being the persistent music therapist that I tend to be, uh, and my husband hates this about it, but I hope my students love it about me, um, I said, well, you know, I'm just going to strum my guitar. And... Let's see if any words come to mind. And I did so. And I strummed the chords for, uh, for Little Nagun, a song without words. And um, I hummed a little bit. And fortunately, I had the recorder on because she spontaneously sang these words along with me. And, uh, and it goes like this. The music is here, the dancing is here, back and forth we go. It's helpful for you, it's helpful for me, the music can save me. It is here when I want it, it is here when I need it, it will be just right for me. <laughs> so you never know when you can bring out someone's creativity with a little persistence. <laughs> so that's BW. And she uh, said, this book, I've been looking for a tool to use as an antidote for pain and tension. Music is a wonderful choice. It makes me feel more secure and optimistic. I truly believe it will help me. And two months later, she wrote me a letter. I won't read the whole thing. But I will read a part of it. After our last, our last session, I had to go up for a blood test which was particularly distressing to me. We know that, right? 
I had been having repeated problems with the test and had been overly emotional about having it again. I was in tears as the nurse tried over and over to get my vein. She asked me to take a deep breath, but I knew that would not help. Without even thinking, my brain must have automatically felt that music would help me. I found myself singing to myself in my head. The music sounded so loud and powerful that I could not focus on the blood test and the singing at the same time. We know this. The music won. The test was over and I was thrilled, all caps, to realize that I had found a tool to help me with these kinds of procedures. I've tried it on a few other occasions and it has been successful for me even with other songs. Hmm. So, um, so that's BC. And I mentioned the Native American food. This is my, my best friend. Um, I love using the Native American flute, not just because it's portable, which does help, uh, not just because it has a beautiful wood and woody sound, a very natural sound, but also because the breath that it necessitates to play it well involves a, a quick, deep inhalation and a long, sustained exhalation, and the ancient yogis and more recently, the uh, coaches in prepared childbirth classes and many different traditions know how important the breath is. And with that long sustained exhalation, we are activating the parasympathetic nervous system, the way, the other side of the sympathetic system that we learned so well about with Dr. Berger this morning. Um, and so, it's helpful for me. And when I'm grounded and I'm centered, I think the people I'm working with are getting a better deal. <laughs> because I know how important my frame of mind, my mood, my presence is, and how much a part of the therapy process that is. A great confounding influence in our research, yes. but absolutely an important ingredient clinically. So uh, so I'd like to just demonstrate a little bit for you. Is that all right? Of course. And if you fall asleep, it's, um, it's a compliment. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I hope you won't, because there's a lot more to learn this afternoon. But it is after lunch, so um, I won't be offended. And I thought if you are game, I invite you to close your eyes. Just take a moment to go inward. I want to give you this gift. And yes, um, just center yourself. Be as comfortable as you can be in your chair. Think about the left side and the right side of your body being equally balanced. Take a nice deep breath in. Become aware of any tension you might feel anywhere of your body. Gently, gently work that out. And as the music begins, notice where it takes you. Notice what's happening.
take a moment as the music has ended to check in, take a nice deep breath, keeping in any good feelings, thoughts, mood that you have. Exhale, let out anything you discovered that you don't need now, any worries, any thoughts, any tension, let it go. Begin to move your fingers, shake out your hands a bit, get the circulation going. Kick out your feet a bit. Yes, just shake them out a bit. Roll your shoulders. Comments? Anything you'd like to share? Yes? Tingles on the back of my head. Ooh, tingles. As I was starting to relax, yeah. So you felt yourself come alive. <laughs> Was it was it a pleasant? Feeling? Yes, yes, yeah, like the back of my like oh. almost like a little breeze or something. I bet that's one of the pulses in cranial sacral <clears throat> therapy. That mm -hmm. might I I don't know. But lots of theories to mm -hmm. uh, to investigate. Yes, Dr. Could Berman. you share with us what you experienced playing that? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, uh, aside from uh, tuning down my own nervous system, <laughs> uh, and tune, I'm trying to tune into you and um, and somehow pick up some of the rhythm of breathing that I'm sensing around me, and um, and trying experimenting to see if I can sense any response to the little trill, the little birdie trills, or uh, the the high notes versus staying low and sustained. So it's just very intuitive improvisation. Hmm, thanks for asking. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, just over here. I, I just, I have to say that in music therapy we kind of stim on <coughs> harmonic instruments like, mm -hmm. and I'm a pianist, so piano and guitar. Me too, yeah. Um, and the voice is connected usually to a person, but when I think about what's really therapeutic in relaxing, that single line wind, where I, where it's just one note, mm -hmm. and there's not all this clutter, right. it's just so beautiful. Not all the overtones. And it helps to breathe so much. So I yeah. I have asthma, and I I was really mm -hmm. connecting to your uh -huh. breathing. Uh -huh. Unconscious. Well, you know, and, and isn't that isn't that quite something? Thank you for the comment. I really think that um, the breath work that um, that that I just mentioned from um, from the the ancient yogis uh, on out, um, I think that wind players and vocalists know so much about the breath and are really uh, exercising the nuance of, of breath. And we are the, the people through our instrumentation in particular, but through our vocal exercises of the experts uh, in this work. And uh, I need to consult more experts in, in winds, and certainly it's quite relevant to people with asthma. But I think uh, in any sort of pain, there may be some, mm -hmm. some hints here for us. So thank you for, uh, for participating in that. Um, there's something called the Valsalva maneuver, Susanna. Yes. Have, you, have you looked into the Valsalva at all? I've, if, I've heard of it. Could you elucidate? You know, when you, if you take a deep breath in and then bear down, you know, whenever you have a bowel movement, basically you Valsalva, and that evokes a parasympathetic response. There you go. And it slows the heart rate. I'd rather play the flute. <laughs> <laughs> So, so perhaps you experienced some of these things, <laughs> and um, and uh, again, as Dr. Tremor was saying, as uh, Dr. Berger and uh, our many eloquent speakers, we're talking about so many aspects of neurophysiological function, neuropsychological function. Uh, so much is is going on uh, with our senses. So let me introduce another uh, another subject. Uh, JB was in the um, the last stages of life, uh, having uh, suffered a brain tumor, and uh, home after uh, the various treatments failed. And um, he was at home in bed. Uh, his 
father was there at the time that I came in to, uh, to work with them. Uh, it was hardly work, although I, I call it sacred work. And, um, and I had my lyre. The lyre is only 12 strings, and I just set it to a diatonic scale. And so I can play some simple folk tunes on it, you know. Um, and, um, and it has its limitations, but I often try to, to play some little melodies and then, you know, just some simple uh, intervals and what have you. And, and it can sound rather okay. Um, but I, I'm kind of a novice at trying to figure out what's my repertoire in this instrument. And so I was really just improvising on the lyre on this particular day. And the father came in and was at his son's uh, bedside. And I said, gee, are there any songs that, that you and Jay know? Are there songs that maybe the family has sung together? And he said, oh, do you know You Are My Sunshine? And I was so thrilled. Because I can play that on the lawyer, except for that da 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 da. You know, I can play that with my, my 12 notes. I felt so good. I start playing You Are My Sunshine, and he is singing along. Would you, would you mind singing along with me? You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know. when we all broke into tears. It's one of those moments when you find a piece of music that says everything that father wanted to say to his son. And what more can be said? What more can be said? This enabled that intimate moment when he was able to express what was going on for him. He found that music. I've sung that song. How many times have you sung that song? I've sung that song. Millions of times. Have I ever listened to the lyrics? <laughs> no. You know, the odd thing about that song is that it was written by the Republican of Louisiana. Yes. State. Um, right. And it's not about. Oh, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. But, boy, those lyrics. Woo! When you put it in, in context. Um, and the other thing that I did, and I'm not going to demonstrate that to you today, was that I took the Native American food in, um, and I started um, learning from... Joanne Lowy uh, and, and Cheryl and Yoka and my other dear colleagues. And I tried to match his breathing with my, my instrument and uh, found myself hyperventilating. But I would try to, if I've learned my lessons well, uh, breathe along with his very labored breath um, and then gradually change to a little bit longer notes, a little more flow to the breath, um, and go back to his, and then gradually change, go back to mine. Um, his oncologist was there at that particular session and said, look how his muscles are relaxing. And of course, the family um, uh, was also visibly relieved. Uh, and he died a few hours later. Um, my friend Robert Kraut uh, has spoken a lot about the release that comes at the end of life, very difficult to research, although he's done masterful work on this, uh, as has uh, Russell Hilliard. Um, but you know, there's still going to be a lot of mysteries we'll never solve, and yet it's intriguing to think about, you know, does the music uh, allow him to, to go to the next chapter, whatever that might be. So I hope I'm just leaving you with some thoughts. And uh, on a technical level, I actually it's a very visceral thing. Yes, may I ask a Carol? question? Oh, of course. So when, so when you were using You Are My Sunshine, which we would think about as kind of a bright song yes. in a dark context, yes. so did you change it to the, or, it, or they, that's the way the father wanted it in that bright context? The father started singing it. I'm not going to introduce, uh, right, introduce right. myself into that That's process. Right. It was a very intimate process. He was sitting and looking into the eyes of his son, and he was singing that. That's all it was. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just, just to bring up the science, because I've got to use both sides of my brain here today. Um, so, I'm not going to get into the subcortex today if Dr. Tremo couldn't 
I certainly won't. <laughs> and yet, um, you know, this is the, the source, perhaps, of some of this primal work, certainly at the end of life, when all we have working <coughs> is uh, subcortex in, in some respects. Um, you know, th this is primal. This is visceral, the, r the rhythm, the, the breath. Uh, this is what we have. And so that's what I worked with, with Jay. Uh, let me give you a case of post-surgery. S.E. So, she uh, had spine surgery, and uh, she says, Immediately after donning the hospital gown on the morning of my surgery, I put on my headset and let the music play. Listening to Defying Gravity from Wicked mm -hmm. allowed me to escape the surgical waiting area and travel to the fantastical world of Wicked where a person can fly above the pain. Interesting image, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The prayer sung by Josh Groban and Charlotte Church led me to a place, Oceanside, where I felt safe. As the anesthesiologist inserted the intravenous needle, I was guided by music-assisted imagery and did not feel the prick. My deep state of relaxation removed any resistance that might have impeded the procedure. Although a pain pump had been inserted, I was reluctant to push the button to release the medication into my bloodstream. Narcotics are, for me, a two-edged sword. Though they may relieve the sharp edge of pain, they adversely impact my gastrointestinal system, and I find that discomfort far more difficult to bear. We know very well the side effects of pain medication. Surgical pain is reflective of healing. So I listened to music and allowed myself to remain in a calm, protected zone. My mind was filled with thoughts of gratitude, of relief, and of hope. I knew the worst of my ordeal was behind me. So I think you can hear many mechanisms going on there, uh, many aspects um, of, of what is going on for her. And, um, and I'm reminded of um, a patient that I talk about in this. Um, and he had a lithotripsy technique for kidney stones and had a, a few of those uh, procedures done. And um, his name is George. Uh, Okay, so I'll, I'll fast forward to post-surgery. The next thing George remembers is waking up in the recovery room. Thanks to his wife's instructions, the surgical nurse had kept George's music playing during the lithotripsy procedure and in recovery. George awakened to the familiar Frank Sinatra CD that he loved. He quickly realized that the procedure was over and that he was doing well. The ordeal was behind him. Nursing staff commented that George's vital signs were excellent. George noted that awakening to his familiar music gave him a few minutes to orient himself to his surroundings. He did not experience the panic and high blood pressure that occurred after his first procedure. Rather, his immediate response to awakening was the calm and soothing feeling brought on by hearing his favorite music. George was discharged within a couple of hours without complications or incident. How simple is that? To just have someone listening to their familiar favorite music while they're coming out of anesthetic. Have you had experience of coming out of anesthetic in a recovery room with the beeping, with the steel, with the white coats? You mentioned how that white coat can be uh, off-putting. That was Jenny this morning. Uh, wearing the black instead of a white coat because of all that it, that it conjures up. And how, in those critical moments of recovery, such a simple, talk about cost effective, I mean, it's so benign, so simple. Why is that not in every post op? Anyway, just a question. Just a question. So, what do the data say? I want to call your attention to a couple of the. Um, kind of meta-analyses. These are the Cochrane reviews. Uh, our dear colleagues here, uh, Yoko Brad and Dilio, uh, were instrumental in doing one on music and cancer. My neighbor in uh, Boston, um, Sapita, looked at, at music and pain. But you know, when you gather all the trials that meet these scientific criteria, you lose a lot in terms of the music. We all know this. But how can one study come to the conclusion that there's a small magnitude of benefit 
Uh, you see they did find a decrease in post-op pain intensity, a decrease in opioid use, but in 51 trials that they looked at that met their criteria, eight of them were music therapy, performed by a music therapist. Why would you expect to see a greater magnitude with someone using who knows what kind of music? Well, I looked at that further. Only 24 of those studies, so slightly less than half, were done with patient-preferred music. Why would we expect a magnitude of benefit for some other kind of music that I might like and I might not, or I might hate, or I might find aversive? So we, we have to wonder about, um, you know, where's the integrity on the music side? That's, if you're a musician or a music therapist or a music professional, that's our responsibility, I think, to introduce that. Uh, and, of course, having two, well, they said four of well-known music therapists do this music and cancer trial, they found 13 that were music therapy and a moderate effect. If we just look at those music therapy studies, I wonder what we would find. But again, these Cochrane reviews have very strict criteria and the, the integrity is not on the side of music. And uh, I will uh, also uh, cite as a Tory study this um, uh, by uh, colleagues of uh, Mark's and, and mine, um, and Blood, and, uh, and Robert Satori. Um, I thank you, Mark, for introducing me to Anne Blood, and, uh, and I saw the fMRI workshop that, um, that she required to do this study about music with chills. And if you are looking at that music, um, just as the, the story by uh, the, the uh, study by Zatori that uh, Dory Berger uh, told us about this morning, um, you see immense changes in the ventral striatum, and the midbrain and amygdala. All of this um, lighting up uh, with um, music that evokes chills. So we know that there's this great potential, and we know this from this is some little student who writes in his journal, I can shut myself in my headphones and escape the pain of living. That's profound. It's profound, isn't it? And my colleague, um, Herbert Benson, the father of the relaxation response, the uh, longtime director of the now Benson Henry Center for Mind-Body Medicine uh, in Boston, um, has another book on the breakout principle. Well, if you've studied Chicksmahalian O Flow, if you've studied Abraham Maslow and the Pig Experience, if you've read all those books on the zone, the inner game of tennis and golf, and you know how you can meet your maximum potential, we're all talking about the same thing. So he's got his own terminology, which is kind of fun uh, for it, but he calls it the breakout. But I thought what was what was so interesting in his research with his colleagues is that. He backed up from that breakout, and it's similar to the research we heard this morning about anticipatory uh, expectation and what have you, that just prior to the breakout, we find a release of nitric oxide in the brain. That's not nitrous oxide, none of this the dental stuff. No. This is nitric oxide. And apparently, that counteracts many stress hormones. Yeah, that would be easy, right? Just take a whiff. We got it made. But anyway, that's not it. Um, and it counteracts uh, norepinephrine uh, as well. And he realizes that it takes a struggle, a stress, pain, where we have to start this process, and then the aha moment. And that's when we find this release. Well, he makes a jump that I don't think is as well documented, but that's sort of the next step that I see in the research, to say, all right, if we have enough of these peak experiences, Fortunately, if you're a musician, I hope you have them in your life, um, and then some, you can achieve a new state of improved mind-body. Sounds good. Sounds good. Let's, uh, where are the data? Let's see the data. So I can't um, leave you without um, reflecting on uh, another case. And uh, some of you know me well, my students know that I, I, decades ago I uh, did research in childbirth. And, um, and it was very successful. I like to think that, um, that studies like that and with um, Clark and McCorkle and you know, early on uh, that perhaps we've contributed to having 
used to be tape decks and then cassette decks and now iPods <laughs> in birthing rooms. Um, and um, and so I, I've you know gotten some reputation, I guess, with that research. And every time I go to a music therapy conference, there's a music therapist who comes up with up to me and she said, you know, I did just what you said in your protocol and I got all my music ready and I went into labor and I couldn't listen to it at all. Is there something wrong with me? Will you treat me? What's going on with me? <laughs> you know, really fearful. It didn't work. And over the years, there's always someone. So I encountered a woman for whom music did not work at all and she said, I need silence. Mm -hmm. And I said, tell me. Uh, about this experience. I thought, this is really important. This is what I'm saying about now my, my charge to look at the responders in my research, because I've done a, a good number of clinical trials. But now, you know, who's responding and who's not? And that's going to confound the research. And if there is someone who is very sensitive to um, sensory overload or is overstimulated by sound and other sensory features, you wouldn't expect that person to respond to music. So music therapy may be contraindicated. I know we don't like to say that, but if we have a true clinical tool, there will be contraindications. And until we can identify those factors, it's just going to confound the research. So here's AA. She says, the music was taking the focus away from my inner coping resource, splitting my resources. When I felt like music made me think and feel, and I wanted to recognize the power of my body. Uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah. Music yeah. is like a person talking to you, a substance that is trying to take care of me. And at that moment, mm -hmm. I wanted to be alone. Uh -huh. hmm. I didn't want anyone to be with me. <laughs> I didn't want hmm. any music. Although ocean sounds felt in sync with my body, and felt natural, music felt artificial, someone intervening in my personal territory. Mm -hmm. I didn't want anyone to touch me. I didn't want anyone there. And, and humming <coughs> and breathing felt natural and helpful. Music did not. Has anyone else mentioned silence in our in our two days, yes. so important, um, so important for us to not only acknowledge silence, but um, but talk about its role as auditory input, uh, very valuable. Certainly in meditation and the relationship between music and meditation, we need to consider when is silence indicated, when is music. Could I just add something Please. as a long-time meditator? Please. Thinking yes. about the woman saying that it's giving birth, yes, and the 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 idea that I've heard here, and is certainly true in mindfulness practice, <coughs> that the mind can only focus on one thing at a time, can have background kinds of a, a kind of wider awareness that takes in the whole thing. Exactly, exactly. Which is that I would think both in birth as it is, is in meditation, at least on the touch of the breath that only one sense door can be activated. Ah. So that so that if you are giving birth, it is completely a touch sensation. And that whatever participation on the part of the, the mother would need to be completely and fully uh, uh, what? And committed, committed to that, yes. to that sensation. Whereas yes. the sound would again be pulling her away. Yes. So that makes total sense yes, from, yes, a, yes. from a mindfulness uh, right, standpoint. Right, right. Yes, I think. Also as a musician, I mean, as a student, music therapist, and a person who does yoga, too, it's easy, I, even myself, working with patients, to think about, am I getting playing the right notes? Sometimes right. it's important to think about playing the right silences, and playing silences between notes. I mean, it, it's easy right. to think about note, 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 note. Right. But there's always, there's always breaks. I mean, beginning, middle, and ends, and then the silence after. That's can be just as profound. Absolutely. Good to remember. I forget myself. Yes. Yes. And indeed. This is, this yes. Is along the same vein, I had a teaching assistant once that was going over to doing clinical work over at the cancer center on campus, and she got a 911 page. You always love it when the music therapists get 911 pages. So um, she went over to. Um, we do a lot of work with the uh, adults who have leukemia, so they're in the room for about a month, and they go near death and then they bring them back, you know, it's 
horrible thing. And um, but the, she walked in this woman's room, and um, the husband's on the phone, the TV's on, the med the med card is coming down the hallway, and the housekeepers mm -hmm. are mopping the floor, whatever. And uh, there's all this stimulation. And she taught me a great lesson. She's like, you know, I'm looking around, and she became like the environment therapist. You know, she's like turning the TV off, asking the husband to go out in the hallway, shutting the room, and this woman wanted to move. And so she's like, okay, we're dancing. And, and so she just totally went with her. And I was like, so I'm always telling my students, it's like, it's not what you're always going to introduce into the environment. Sometimes you have to think about what you're going to take out of the environment. Oh. You know? And so yes, it's that yeah. two-way street kind yeah. of thing. So when it gets yeah. just to that, because I'm like, I'm the same way. I'm like, don't mess with me. If I'm not comfortable, leave me alone. Mm -hmm. So. Well, what a tremendous confounding variable we have. We, we're, mm. we're looking at all this research, and yet there are people who, for whom it's contraindicated. Thank you for these great comments. This is what's so wonderful about this conference. Yes. I would add to this, though, the comment that somebody made yesterday or today, how do we define music? Ah, uh, yes. Because then you, if you're going to include that silence is music, silence is music. I and in that case, it sounded to me like there actually was a lot of music that was going on. Ah, so it was a rhythmic sense. She liked it was the her humming, music. the ocean, and, and it was her natural music. Right. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank I you. I would just that. argue that we need to be transparent about what happened. That's right. Not that we get into this definition about what is and what isn't music, but just being transparent about what happened. Yes, I agree. Mm. Oh, I'm so thrilled. Yes, sir. Well, it seems to me it wasn't silence that she wanted. From her story, she wanted natural sounds. Yes. And as a musician also, um, I find it really hard to listen to music because I either am trying to recreate it or finger it while I'm listening to oh, it. Oh, absolutely. Or, but you, everybody's experience is different. You know, I, I listen to whale songs and stuff like that, yes. uh, field recordings, um, to relax or to stimulate my creativity. Right. Um, but I think some people will listen to that orchestrated, and some people, it's the only place where they can relax. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, uh, but yeah, then to take it one step further to silence, uh, how many people, when they're trying to fall asleep, they just try to listen to the sound of their own breath, you know, and, you know, focus on that, or relax before seeing the doctor, or exactly. anything like that. Exactly. You know. I'm thrilled that all of you have something to say about this. Uh, another conference. Yeah. Dr. Lowy. Just <laughs> on <Stand> silence. Just <laughs> on silence. Whatever that means. That maybe there is no silence. All right, profound. <laughs> well, then, yesterday with Dr. Carr's talk, yes. there was a whole discussion on placebo mm -hmm. and exactly. nocebo, and that's just another element when we're thinking about intention right. and space. Right, right. Well, my colleagues this morning, Dr. Berger, Dr. Trayman, uh, <coughs> talked more eloquently about the uh, autonomic nervous system. I'm particularly interested, being a, an active music therapist, of that balancing point in between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. And I must talk with my, my colleagues more about how we can identify this peculiar point at which we're actively making music. So we're not, we, our intention is not to activate couch potato bliss of the parasympathetic system. Yeah. Our um, intention is perhaps to uh, activate heart rate variability and stamina and in, um, endurance and to look at the, the relationship in achieving homeostasis between music, which is engaging and is bringing out um, all sorts of activity. If we could go to that other, other slide, the emotion, the mood, the changes in the physiology, neurology, etc. And I think that, that this is the critical moment that uh, I'm seeking to explain with your help. And speaking of your help, um, I wanted to show you uh, the next stage of, of my thinking in, in research. Uh, on the left is this um, mechanism, which is a self-administered pain medication, which um, sorry, I'm in your way. Um, which is 
Um, currently, state of the art. I um, was talking with Dr. Carr yesterday about um, patient controlled uh, medication that is um, that is used um, almost everywhere in the world for those people who have read the research about the locus of control and how important it is for a, a patient to control their own pain medication. This device on the left is called, I love it, on cue pain buster post-op pain relief system. <laughs> Don't you love it? It's a mouthful. Well, on the right is an iPod. And that's my on cue pain buster post op <laughs> pain relief system. And I uh, was chatting with, with Dr. Carr and want very much to talk with all of you who are working in pain management about um, the next study that, that I hope to, um, to perform, which is essentially offering pain medication to any patient, whether it's post surgery or in palliative care and not interfering with their ability to control the mm. amount of pain medication that they're getting, but on the other hand, almost literally introducing an iPod and looking at the relationship between the choice of music with specially and individually designed playlists that induce different memories, associations, moods, affect, Etc., and just observing the relationship, and as the person listens to more music, be it playlist A or B, uh, are they using less medication? And hopefully, uh, again, with the help of my um, physician uh, colleagues, can we find out the, the, the norm? Can we predict what pain medication choice might look like? for a patient of, the, of a similar condition, and can we then determine whether uh, music is actually minimizing the use of pain medication. So please come see me, work with me, and, um, and tell me what you think uh, of that pr protocol. And I'm going to end with, on an incredible coincidence, which mm -hmm. my, my son of blessed memory would say is not a coincidence, with precisely the poem that my, my new neighbor, Dr. Carr, uh, brought to you yesterday, perhaps it bears repeating, I, I think perhaps Dr. Carty would agree, uh, pain has an element of blank by Emily Dickinson. Pain has an element of black. It cannot recollect when it began, when it begun or if there were a time when it was not. It has no future but itself. It's infinite, contained, it's past, enlightened to perceive new periods of pain. Hmm. I hope that your next steps are free of pain and full of beautiful music. Mm. I thank you for your attention and thank you for coming. Just, we have time for a question. If any, that was lovely. Thank you. If anyone has a question, although we've had we, comments I all can along. See you, I can see you uh, after. I just want to say something you said earlier, and I can't remember what, and also something that, is it Dr. Trano? Trano, yes. Trano, um, about the future being in the present. I know from studies about people who've died and come back, they talk about the different senses going, and I yes. understand that hearing is the last, and that people get a buzzing in their ears or something. Mm. And I always think of the, um, because I, 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 my other life, I was a, English major and creative writer, mm -hmm. and an author I did for my orals was Emily Dickinson, uh -huh. and so I wrote, read a lot about her, and she was fascinated with death, and she would rush to people's bedsides that she hardly knew in the, in the community <laughs> oh. to see what happened to them as they crossed over. She was fascinated by that. So you might know this poem, I heard a fly buzz when I died. That, that's the, the first line in the title. Oh, yeah. And I always thought that was so interesting because of that, those later studies about the, she must have asked somebody, what are you experiencing? And there was a buzzing in the ear. But all this just to say that, of course, what's, what's so wonderful and odd about it is, of course, you have to be dead to do it. You know, she's saying that she died and yet she wrote the poem yes. about that thing you're saying about the, few, the part of the brain that, that is in the future or brings the future yes. into the present. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of this wonderful conference.
Thank mm-hmm. you.